Davis will, by um, some technology magic, be joining me on screen. So I can pass over the mic to Hugh, who is the co-founder uh, um, of uh, Ozone. Hugh, hello. How are you doing? Hello, Helen. Very good. Thank you. It's I would say long time no see, but it really hasn't been. <laughs> no, it, <laughs> it has. Do you know, we have just had the most amazing conversation. And, you know, it's one of those conversations I wish we could have had down the pub. You know, um, the I've been listening. I, I, I don't know what I'm going to talk about now. You guys have covered some great stuff. So many use cases um, that uh, I hadn't heard of before. And I know that your panel um, are going to be talking about the industry. So I will stay tuned in backstage and can't wait to hear more of you. Thank Good you. Good luck Helen. and wish you the very best. Take care. See you soon. Thank you. Um, so, uh, as Helen mentioned, I'm Hugh Davis. I'm um, uh, founder at uh, Ozone API. We are a, a technology business that help banks and financial institutions implement these open banking APIs so they can be standards compliant and, and, and deliver a, a really strong um, open banking channel to the market. Um, I also spent a bit of time helping um, lead the development of, of the open banking ecosystem in the UK. And I am delighted and privileged to be uh, hosting this uh, second half of the session. Um, we've got a great panel. So whilst Helen and um, the team were talking about some of the, the various use cases and the, the end user implications, we'll be talking a bit more about um, just the overall state of the industry. Um, where are we? In, in progress, what are some of the opportunities and challenges, where will we go next? And I'm delighted to be joined by a fantastic panel for the conversation today. Um, so we have um, Brendan Jones uh, from Consensus, we have Phil Gillespie from And Digital, and last but certainly not least, we have Graham Cressy from Accenture. So uh, fantastic, I can see you're all in. So gentlemen, welcome, thank you for joining this afternoon. Um, we've got we've got an act to follow after Helen and Helen and the team just now. So um, yeah, looking looking forward to a, a really good conversation. Um, I, I perhaps won't ask you to each do a, an individual sort of intro, but as we go through the questions, obviously do feel free to to sort of talk a little bit more about yourselves and your, your background as we're going through uh, the, the questions and answers. But I, I guess starting with the current state of open banking we're at four years into the open banking journey in 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 the uk slightly less in europe from an implementation perspective it'd be great to get your perspectives on 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 where are we in that journey actually and brendan I'll, I'll start with you if i may because i know you guys um sort of regularly put out uh, uh data on the um the maturity of the ecosystem and, and how things are developing what's what's your view on where we are at the moment in the journey Hi, Hugh, and uh, yeah, great, and really pleased to be here today. Um, yeah, I think you're right. You say we've been four years on the journey. The reality is it's four years in the UK, just over two years in Europe. Um, and I think where we are on the journey, I think we have to look at them separately. So um, I think within the UK, coming with the exact number of third-party providers we've got operating in the UK now, but we've got... Uh, a wealth of third parties. We've got a very healthy ecosystem. We've got a, a central authority that obviously can look at the ecosystem for us and let us know how it's performing in terms of the volume of transactions that are going through, the type of transactions, API availability, and all that great stuff, which is which is good. We sort of moved to Europe, and it's I think as, as we know, we've spoken about this in the past, it's much more fragmented in Europe. We don't have that centralized approach. But it... In two years, the ecosystem has really started to flourish in, in Europe. We've got just over 300 fintech TPPs now operating in Europe, excluding the UK. And in our last analysis, we saw there's around 1,200 banks also who are operating in the TPP capacity across Europe. What we do see, though, is regional variations about transaction volumes that are going through. Um, I don't think any of us would be surprised to hear that there's high volume of transactions in the Nordic region, whereby obviously banking infrastructure is modern by maybe some other countries within the EU. Um, we see down in Southern Europe uh, a much lower volume of transactions currently uh, being conducted on a monthly basis. 
And I think, you know, we're, we're, we're all in danger sometimes of looking at Europe as a whole. It's actually 30 different countries that got different demographics, have traditionally different payment methods per country and so on. But with, with 300 TPPs, with 50, uh, sorry, 1,200 odd banks acting in that capacity, I think we're going in the right way. We're seeing a whole collection of different types of TPPs in the market offering different types of services. So I think it's a positive start. I think my one reservation for Europe is I'm not sure anybody would ever be able to say the degree of success for Europe because there is no central entity that's overseeing the ecosystem. So it's particularly difficult to actually manage and predict what's going on at a granular level, country by country. Yeah, it's a really good point, actually, Brendan, because, I mean, we see in the UK where there is sort of much tighter oversight around the nine largest banks. We are getting monitoring and reporting. In the last panel, they were talking about um, um, the, the millions of users, and we see that from the data. We see the data around monthly API call volumes. It's sort of well over 800 million a month now. Even see, We've seen the, the number of payments growing as well, but you're right, we don't have that oversight right across Europe. And, and Phil, yeah. just thinking about some of those numbers, it, um, I think it's been really interesting to see payments have, have actually started to to increase in, in, in volume now. I mean, what are your thoughts on where we are in that journey around adoption? What are the things that you think will be or are being the catalysts for, for this to really take hold? It's a good question. And, and I would echo a lot of the things that um, Brendan has said. Before I joined and I, I did some uh, consultancy work, but before that, I was the chief product officer at Money Dashboard, one of the oldest fintechs in the UK. So we had uh, we came in as a TPP as part of the open banking working group before the implementation entity. And one of the, the one of the personal um, professional frustrations I have with open banking is there are inevitably delays. You know, we wanted to be ahead of PSD2 because we wanted to get ahead of the game and actually have things improve. And we ended up delaying it um, and delaying it and aligning with the PSD2 rollout, which, you know, th there's a lot of, um, it was good to have ambitions. But I think that payment, that alignment with PSD2 kind of did two things. The first wave of open banking for me was obviously the account aggregation. You know, it's something Money Dashboard was uh, designed for. And that's giving consumers the ability to understand, to helping them to understand their finance if they have that sort of desire. But that only goes so far the next bit is, okay, what do I do? And that's either an advice gap or a, can you just do it for me? Can you move money between my accounts? I've gone overdrawn and I wasn't paying attention today, but I've got a savings with Marcus from Goldman Sachs. Can you just take the money out of there and move it in without me getting a, an overdraft fine or a, and a hit on my credit score? So I think that the payment is, is a natural progression. It is one of those, you know, it, this is we are moving quick, but we're also moving slow. So in an ideal world, we would have on day one proper payments, refunds, variable payments, recurring, all of these um, all of these payments available very early on. But it was a very much a let's do it bit by bit. Let's not do refunds. Let's not do high value. And there are lots of market. There are lots of opportunities. As I think about uh, consumers in the UK, I guess the big challenge is because we are so card driven and that's ignoring the, the the effects of the pandemic for a lot of consumers, I can pay with my Visa or MasterCard or American Express. Why, where is that? Where is this actually giving me any benefit uh, for, you know, the, the use case of being able to buy something from a, an online retailer? The difference is obviously when we get to the payments being made in the wealth space, then and not realizing that things aren't free. I, you know, consumers have this perception, that, oh, everything's free. I just swipe my card, it's free, I swipe, make a payment, it's all free. And not really, not realizing not just the cost of the business, but the infrastructure cost as well and the different hops that you're going through there. So I think there's a, we've come a long way for um, in the payment space. There's a lot more to go. But I think part of it is either giving a better return for the customer because on the face value, Everything's free in the uh, from banking in the UK. I don't pay, even pay for my bank account. It's just so some of the perceived benefits are very much B two B, and it's trying to transition to that B two B to C to to make it realise for the consumer. 
Yeah, it's a good point. I, I think there's a really good conversation there around what this means for for, for business models, and I'd, I'd like to come back to that um, in, in a short while, if I may. But um, I mean, we've just been talking about some of the the developments we've been seeing in the the, the industry. I mean, Graham, you're, you you guys are working sort of day in day out with with players in the ecosystem and supporting their innovation strategies. I mean, what are you seeing? What, what are the use cases you're seeing that are exciting you? And what do you think this is meaning for the, um, I guess, the business models of the, the fintechs and the banks and, and other players in the ecosystem? Yes, it's a really interesting discussion. And again, agree with everything the guys are saying. So uh, in my life in Accenture, I run the Fintech Innovation Lab. So we see kind of 20 fintechs come through each year. And what's been brilliant with an open banking hat on for that is that we've gone from open banking to open data to embedded finance going into next year that's our theme and we've really moved away from what the hell is open banking i don't you know how does it work what do what what are the rules to actually well how do i get the value out of that and to those use cases i think we've been able to see actually from going from a strategy paper that says well look you could have api monetization models you're now saying, well, actually, you can lend to people that you couldn't lend to before. You can top up your accounts seamlessly with a few clicks rather than pulling a card out and typing numbers in and so on. And I think what we've really seen to those use cases is that the businesses actually get that unless they're doing some of this open banking stuff, they're missing out on revenue. And I think if we look into the market to some of those business models, embedded finance is really showing that there are new business models now. There's a bunch of companies doing FS and financial services that banks would otherwise typically have done. So buy now, pay later is a great example. Like there's a bunch of companies that have come in providing lending, providing payment services. And uh, I think the banks starting to catch up and realize there's uh, there's opportunities there to do that. Yeah, and it's interesting. In the, the, the previous discussion, one of the things Brian mentioned was um, – balance sheet, uh, banks typically have really strong balance sheets and that they they can fill this need and this gap for for lending but through delivering really good open apis they can they can actually be present in that journey at the point it's needed what as, as opposed to the old days where you had to go into a branch or, or fill out an application on the bank's own um uh, online channel so i mean it does i, I agree with you wholeheartedly I, I think this is a really exciting opportunity for for banks to change their business model if we look across Europe though um, there are still quite a few banks that haven't implemented their open banking apis yet they aren't necessarily yet compliant with PSD2 that I mean we, we talked a lot so there are still quite a few that are seeing this as well this is a compliance headache isn't it I mean what do you what do we think it, it, it it'll take for the banks that haven't got it yet and, and some of them really have there are some banks that are really building organizations and teams around the opportunity here but i mean phil i'm really interested in your perspective what what do you think needs to happen for for all of the banks to to really get it or or, or for those that don't to to start feeling it I'm smiling away here because it, it brought back memories of the CMA9 and uh, a, a discussion a, a good few years ago. Uh, there was one bank, I uh, I will name them because it's in a positive sense, it was Barclays. They got it from day one. They sent their head of customer, their head of customers to open banking because it's about the value we can deliver to our customers. And to the point you made, there, are, there were other banks who sent their head of compliance. And if you just see this as oh, something else we've got to do by the end of the year, you're you're not going to win. It, it, someone else is going to come along and eat your lunch because you're you're almost having this entitled view of this is mine. These are all my customers, and you're not getting them. So I'll fine. I'll do this to tick a box. And I think it's a mindset shift. I think it's that moment where you, as you say, what will it take to make them get it? It's that that moment where they go. I see now. Now I can actually see. You're right. The uh, the the length, the amount of um, money that banks have um, uh, sitting uh, on their balance sheet. I think it's Ant Financial in China when they used all of the money that was um, sitting as spare change in their um, in their wallets. That instantly became the largest investment fund in the world. I 
I hope I've got the 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 uh, and financial correct, but it's it's shocking that it's absolutely terrifying the amount the power of that accumulation of 1.4 1.5 billion people of the small change. Banks have enormous opportunity with open finance uh, with open finance and open banking and PSD two if they will look at it if they will just following on from the last panel open their mind if they will think about what are the other possibilities rather than the closed mind of, okay, I've got to do this and I've got to do this. And you're in this narrow situation. So, I mean, we're kind of lucky in the UK that the government stepped in and the, there was regulation forcing banks to act and forcing the CMA nine. I, I'm sure the big nine they weren't really happy about that initially, but it definitely pushed them forward. And as I said earlier, sure, there are delays, and but it was an aspirational thing. I, the only other thing I, I think about Europe about from to echo Brenda's point about regulation and that central governance is my understanding is, and I'm not a, an expert in uh, Europe, is that I think there's a set of standards for France, a set of standards for Germany, one in Poland and it, possibly Italy as well, are the competing almost API, um, uh, the data models that are being used rather than agreeing it with this centralized structure. So it's a it's a bit more of a challenge to get that coherent approach, but I think it's um there is an element of you will be left behind if you don't do this and and don't embrace this. So why not be first? Why not be one of the leaders? And, and you raise a really good point there, Phil, around the um, potential fragmentation of standards. I do want to come back to that in a bit when we start looking at what's happening around the world. Because um, yeah, I think there's a there's a genuine challenge there. I mean. Brendan, a, a consensus, you guys are, are obviously working with and talking to banks um, sort of right across Europe as well as around the world. But um, have you seen have you seen a, a switch in attitude and, and mindset and approach um, over the, the, the past few years? Yeah, I, I think we have. I, I just want to pick up on a couple of points that Phil made there. See, I think one of the problems with PSD2 is it was a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Those very large financial institutions that support millions of customers and so on typically are the ones who've implemented two regulation in the first instance and have started developing the use cases. But I suppose, you know, if you're a challenger bank with a few hundred thousand, where actually, you know, again, because of the narrow definition of open banking in Europe, it's about transacting accounts today. If you're one of those smaller banks or maybe you're, you're an EMI out there where actually the accounts you're managing are secondary accounts for the consumers, you are faced with a high cost of um, compliance for basically very little return. And, and, and I think that's part of the dichotomy that's been in the market thus far. However, I think... As the market starts to develop, we've already, and, and, and Phil said it, open finance, it crept out very quickly, very early. <laughs> we're, we're, we're moving to these broader business models, which are more encompassing in terms of the account types that can be um, accessed and the way data can be used. I think that will encourage a larger plethora of financial institutions. Don't forget, there's, there's 5,000 financial institutions across Europe alone excluding the UK and and you're right I think probably two-thirds are only compliant thus far but as they can start to see opportunity for whereby it's not just about compliance it's actually about commercial opportunity for those banks to deliver new products and services either through in-house development or through collaboration with fintechs we will start to see that investment and that tail of financial institutions come into compliance ultimately I think what hasn't helped us, and I, I, I hate to use the word P, is the pandemic, because the regulators had many more important things over the last year and a half, two years, since September in 2019 to worry about than whether banks had implemented APIs. So Yeah, I, 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 I do think that's a good point, actually. It's, it's, it's clearly had an impact. Interesting, if you look around the world, and, and we'll come on to this in a minute, some regulators have seen that as an opportunity to drive things harder, but but in Europe, but yeah, I, you can understand less scrutiny on ensuring every single one of the perhaps smaller financial institutions have 
and yeah. and it's all it's financial, stability, financial stability yeah. was top of the agenda. Yeah, absolutely. And and I guess so. We we talked here around. I think there are some some really strong signs in terms of the the ecosystem growing, and we're even talking about moving from open banking to open finance, embedded finance, all of these things. There are some challenges still in terms of. Um, not necessarily all of the banks are there yet and not necessarily with, with consistent standards. But what uh, interested just your thoughts on from where we are today in the UK and Europe, and then we'll switch gear and, and look around the world. What, what are some of the biggest blockers and challenges we see right now in terms of this kind of really taking off to the next level in terms of um of, of scale adoption and usage graham again you you're spending a lot of time with innovative new fintechs what do you what do you think are some of the challenges here i think tying it a little bit to the last question as well i think the customer is a major part of the adoption like if the customers are driving for demand so like we've seen with subscriptions and the amount of things that are now on subscriptions well therefore something like vrp variable recurring payments suddenly has more relevance and things like people fintechs like aptap for example that do subscription management suddenly there is actually a consumer demand for it i think that is a real adoption point but the blocker to your, to your current question i think is when it's done badly it's such a turn off i can't count the amount of hours i've spent categorizing my transactions <laughs> in my different banking apps to try and see if one can actually tell me something useful to do with it off the back of it. And more often than not, they don't. And they forget that you've categorized something a particular way. And that just is a massive switch off to then try and do it again, when actually the market and the capabilities move forward quite a lot, and actually it might be more effective next time. So I think we've got to get the experience right for customers. And I think what's been really encouraging is seeing a number of the big banks in particular, being much braver about how they use their brand in terms of pairing up with some of the people doing cutting edge stuff. So NatWest gone to market with Kogo alongside them, for example, for sustainability, or to give Barclays another shout out, their, um, uh, their future lab type capability that is actually live in the main mobile app that you can sign up to and try different things and feedback on. So I think if we can use a few things like that to iron out the friction points and actually get to useful bits of Phil's point really, like the so what, the, the payment element or the activity action on the back of it, that's just gonna drive much smoother, better experiences and adoption. Yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry I was just gonna, thanks, Hugh. I was just gonna echo one of the points that Graham made, the, the categorization obviously, uh, haunting flashbacks to my time at Money Dashboard of trying to categorize all of this data that was uh, was coming in, because open banking is, especially in the beginning for account aggregators, was seen as this wonderful um, solution, but it's raw data you get. It's the same data you're getting from the bank. And if it says John Lewis, is that my friend John Lewis or is that the retail store? And the way councils around the country start dealing with council tax versus nursery fees versus parking fines, Right now, it's kind of okay, and you can get by with doing minimal categorization, but whoever really nails offering categorization to other people as a, as a third-party solution will really excel because when we look at alternative, and I appreciate this might be jumping ahead, but alternative things like credit scoring based on your transactions or trying to work out what the right mortgage is for you, then, as you said, Graham, I need to understand what your spending is rather than just the gross, this is what came in, this is what went out, and just a quick um, differentiator between the two. It's the, actually, let's make the data, let's enrich the data and make it more valuable. I think that's a big blocker. It's solvable, but it's a blocker. When And, and it's compounded a little bit as well by the point you were raising earlier. In, in, if we look across Europe, there are multiple different standards and, and they will all, and, and they'll be implemented in slightly different different ways by the banks. I, I think one of the standout um, differences between UK and the rest of Europe, in UK, at least for the biggest banks, there was a single mandated standard and they were required to go through conformance and certification. Europe, it's that there are a number of different standards. Um, and are often less prescriptive without, and there is no mandate to go through conformance and certification. And I think that, yeah, there's, there's 
plenty of opinion and data out there that, that suggest it does make it a much, much harder environment for, for third parties to connect. Which kind of brings us on to there are open banking initiatives regulation is now rolling out in quite a few other places around the world. So we've got Brazil right in the midst of rollout at the moment, Mexico uh, sort of working on the, the next stage of the fintech law, Canada have, have um, published their intents around um, consumer directed finance, uh, Saudi Arabia have, have, have made their intentions clear and there's lots going on in the Middle East. This is, this is happening right around the world. Um, I'm interested, uh, um, maybe start with you, Brendan. I, I, again, I know you guys are, are very, very active around the world. What are the markets you're excited about and, and why? I think to answer that question, I, I would have to say the markets I'm most excited about is where they have articulated the value proposition of open banking for a country. Because I think as you move to different countries, the drivers to open banking are very, very different. And I think that sets up how you deploy the ecosystem and the level of engagement you will see from the participants in the ecosystem. If we think back to looking about what happened in Europe, it was all about driving innovation. It was about encouraging competition. Very little really about the payment service users themselves getting great journeys, getting access to data and so on. We move into Latin America and it's very much about financial inclusion. You know, those are the big drivers in all those those countries to maximize the potential of, of open banking, not just for existing banked population, but in most countries, actually the unbanked population, which is bigger than the banked population. So LATAM, I think, holds great hope. Um, you know, and I think we have to uh, praise and recognize where things have gone extremely well. And I think if you look how long it took us to do in the UK and Europe, and we look at what's happened in Brazil, hats off to the Brazilian uh, open banking community at the speed of execution from initial regulation through to where we are today. Already, as we know, out consulting on open insurance, which will sit alongside open finance. I think we can all learn from that as we've all learned within Europe. Um, I think the Middle East holds some interesting opportunities. I suppose none of us have really talked about and no one ever talks about, but you know, the African continent has got to be a huge opportunity. At some point, the big question is when. Yeah, it, and you raised some really good points. It <laughs> brought back a memory, in fact. So I think four days before lockdown came in in the UK, I was in Sao Paulo meeting with the, the central bank um, talking about um, the, the, the upcoming open banking regulation. And I was convinced going into the meeting that because things were, were also kind of really happening from, unfortunately, from a, from a pandemic perspective in Brazil, I thought the meeting was going to be cancelled. This thing was going to be put off for, for a year or so. And, and, and no, actually, we went ahead and the central bank then said, no, we, we will drive this. This is yeah. really important for the country. And it's, it, it's, it's been amazing to see. I mean, we're in the process of helping quite a few banks implement their, their APIs at the moment. And the market really has moved. It's, it's, it's been incredible to see. And, and, and you know, maybe we'll come on to this a little bit later about why these sorts of uh, programs have been successful. But I think the adoption model has got a lot to underpin the success of um, what we're seeing in Brazil predicated off the UK versus the fragmentation that we see in Europe, uh, whereby regulation tells you just what to do, but not necessarily how to do it. Yeah, and that, that's one of the, as I, again, Brazil are taking this as an e example. There is a single standard that all banks are being mandated to, to implement and with conformance and certification. Phil, Phil, from the perspective, your, your previous perspective as a, as a third party building propositions based on um, on this 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 access to banks, how, how important is that? Do you think? I think it's really important, and and Brendan touched on uh, the people who are underbanked and financial inclusion. It's uh, obviously a very big thing that was important to help people. Uh, you know, it's the everyone knows that they should be better with their money. But there are lots of challenges to it, whether it's information that they've got or time or 
I, you know, the the income that's uh, and the the debts that they've actually got, it's it's easier sometimes to bury your head under the pillow. I, I mean, I've done it in a long time ago of just like I'm going to ignore everything because it's bringing me down and it's a it's a serious challenge uh, for an awful lot of people. Uh, and this is in the UK, a very um, a fairly wealthy country, but around the world. Um, and to echo some of the points that that Brendan says, I mean, I'm think uh, there's a couple of places that. I think are really interesting. India, I I believe uh, I was reading a McKinsey report uh, earlier this summer, and they were talking about up to four and a half percent increase in GDP if um, for the what they're doing with open banking is a potential, given the again the size and the scale and the amount of people without basic bank accounts and trying to interact, especially from a payments perspective. Uh, India is pretty uh, impressive. It's technically going outside of open banking, but it's the other end of the scale The in Australia and the uh, consumer data uh, rights, I believe, CDR is the, uh, the name of the... Uh, cool, thanks. Uh, that is very interesting to look at it from the other end of rather than initiating from the payments going, okay, you've got the data now, where do we actually go in almost taking a different approach? And in between, um, uh, from my own personal experience, in between money dashboard and and digital i uh, i helped design and build the uh, mox virtual bank for standard charters uh with the great team at 11fs and we did this in uh stand uh, in hong kong and that is a, a completely different market looking at the the speed of payments they were super keen on instant payments not faster payments within two hours but actual delivering instant which for the cultural differences in the special administrative region of Hong Kong, and then even crossing over into um, China, the potential there of how, when you start thinking about how people can benefit with a, of understanding of the making payments and the finance outside of, well, there's a bank on the high street that they just used to send me paper statements and we've digitized this and now I've got it electronic. It's the, let's rethink everything and let's look at how we can actually make it valuable and take into and take learnings from cultures. So, I think there are three different areas of um, Australia, India, and, and Hong Kong and China that you're looking at. Okay, they can all offer considerable cultural differences to the UK and Europe that we'd be fools not to learn from. Yeah, I think that's a really good point actually because there, there are such different approaches around around the world. And as you were outlining earlier, Brandon, as well for for different reasons, whether it's financial inclusion or driving a more uh, competitive industry to attract inward investment or whether it's driven by competition regulation there are there are different drivers as well as different implementation approaches i mean graham at accenture you guys obviously have a very global view on this um what are your views in terms of where some of the interesting stuff is is happening yeah it's uh, we've been on the brazil bandwagon with open banking excellence as well they've um, been doing some great work trying to take it over there and support with the learnings and i guess our overarching reflection is that it's all a bit cyclical like each of the regulators is learning and observing the others and it's getting a bit competitive can we broaden the scope can we go a bit deeper can we do it a bit better so the uk started really at the sharp end and i think almost full circle the uk is now again quite exciting if it's looking at uh, kind of open pensions and things like that where there's so much value for consumers who are blind to these things not necessarily making the best choices for their, their long term so um yeah I, I can't do a better round the world uh, summary than the other guys but i think it is interesting seeing how they've all sort of evolved from one another and then as you say tailored it to to their specific areas of need when uh, you, you you talk there uh, uh, and we mentioned earlier as well that sort of embedded finance concept um and, and phil you were outlining earlier some of the challenges just around the payments element of, of open banking at the moment so right now yeah there's a there's a redirect for every payment there isn't necessarily immediate certainty around the status of the payment refunds can be difficult all of these sorts of things and we've got we've got this concept of variable recurring payments that can potentially be the silver bullet that that allows really embedded payment experiences with intelligent uh, ongoing intelligence and an ongoing consent. You, you combine that with a really good instant payment rail and status inf information. You, you can you can unlock that. That isn't yet sort of mandated by 
regulation other than a in the UK a very specific use case around my account to my account sweeping. But how how important do we think is this sort of functionality to to really act as a catalyst for for some of these embedded finance type use cases and and, and if so what needs to happen for us to to unlock this? I'm, there's, there's two parts to that. And I'm, perhaps, Graham, I, I'll start with you just to mm. get your view in, in terms of how important is this to really unlock embedded finance. And then perhaps we can have a bit of a discussion between us in terms of, yeah, what, what needs to happen to actually make it happen? So I, I love it. I think it's a, it's a fantastic thing to be doing because it moves a whole degree of uh, experience and engagement and functionality into where the customer actually is. So if from a brand point of view, if you're a mobile phone company, for example, that, that ability to have an engagement with your customer about what they can afford to pay, when they can afford to pay it, what terms they'd want to do it on, you can absolutely decide your business logic and rules and so on around that. But you very much own that relationship and it's much deeper and richer than it would otherwise be if it was just a direct debit or a standing order and the bank was involved and you had to go and log into a different app to change the date and sign a paper form that disappears and you never see it again and all, all sorts of stuff. So I think it's fantastic. It comes back almost to that sort of we've got away from doing open banking because we should be surfacing stuff to actually this is what customers have a need for to control their money, to control the permissions and it's empowering them to do that. So yeah, big big advocates for it and a huge, huge opportunity um, for what it could become, I think. And, and Phil, be good to get your, your views here because um, I mean, right now there's some fantastic functionality in the standards. It's not necessarily mandated yet, but it can enable all of some of the really exciting um, uh, sort of scenarios you talked about earlier in terms of not just seeing the insight, but actually taking action. W what do you think needs to happen within the industry to, 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 to really unlock this at scale? Is this a commercial question? Is this a, what, yeah, what are the things that the industry needs to tackle to, to make this a reality? So the commercial thing is is an interesting point, and I mean Graham uh, nailed it really with the just the the, the opportunity that um, variable recurring payments brings. For so long, the mindset has been, okay, if I want to engage with a, a consumer, I am going to get a monthly fixed direct debit. Yes, technically you can vary it, but that brings all sorts of questions, and and it, it brings scariness. I'd rather have just like one flat fee that I know what's going on. So being able to have that more regularly, being able to have it, being able to understand what people can actually afford, being able to even open up things like micropayments on a more um, wider basis, mm -hmm. it opens up so much more possibility and changes people's minds from a commercial uh, nature. I personally, one of the things I think needs to happen is that the ability, and I know it's being discussed, I don't think it's been agreed, but to remove 90-day um, permissions. I think ongoing consent, um, I know it's been talked about for variable uh, recurring payments, but um, for account aggregation as well, I think ongoing consent until I say no, really puts me in charge of, I trust these um, guys, I trust uh, these guys, I actually now want them to start helping me with, and I want to have, and I trust this retailer or company I'm engaging with, and I want to actually start maximizing that if every, you know, if I'm going back and having to reapprove that, it's, I want someone to look after it for me. And if it is micropayments or better engagement or the, my usage, it's varying. And I'm, uh, and it, you know, a lot of people struggle with budgeting on a monthly basis because that's a long way, especially if you're paid weekly or, or if you're paid four weekly and it doesn't align, the 13 don't align with the 12 months. If you can do something that is weekly, if you can then actually make it a lot more tangible and you can have money coming in and out if you're, trying to improve your um, uh, your credit rating and actually improve your the state of your finances. It, I, I mean, I echo uh, the, the excitement of Graham. It opens up so much, but I think it's the, the change in the mindset of from a commercial nature of what could be possible, and it's a lot more than the standard things we're doing. And the second bit is that making it until I say no, giving that ongoing consent. I think those are the two big things for me. Yeah, I, and I, I think it, it, it creates an interesting new dynamic in the industry. So banks are making this richer functionality available for their own, for, for the customer's good, for their own good, but but not because of a, 
a regulatory driver. It starts to change the nature of the ecosystem as well. Because right now, and Brendan, this is right in the sweet spot of what you guys do. Right now, you have regulated parties that connect to banks. Have we lost you guys? I think we've lost. Not just me. Okay, it's a good statement. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, just, okay. just just while he comes back, Phil, I think something you touched on um, that was so important that we've maybe just glossed over a little bit is that things like direct debits have got a price premium on them, and not everyone can afford to have a direct debit, and yet that's the cheapest way to get your stuff. Yeah. So the people who need the help the most are adversely impacted. So I think there's a real opportunity with open banking and we saw it with Nationwide's Open Banking for Good program and so on to really help people through open banking, whether it's consolidating receipts for debt plans or whether it's enabling them to get the lowest cost service uh, at payments they can control. It's uh, yeah, quite completely. Well, I, I, I think it's overall, isn't it? Using open banking, we can drive the cost of payments down from, you know, you would remember back to chat payments of £40 every time you want to execute it. You know, we laugh at it now, but that's the reality of what we used to have to pay. And, you know, sadly, we accepted it. But now with these new technologies, it's about building the use case. And if you can build the use case, people will use it. And I, I sometimes amongst us get a bit frustrated about using the term open banking it's not it's about propositions that consumers want to engage with open banking is a technology and rails they shouldn't have to worry or know about it hello Absolutely. Jim, you're back what what a bunch of professionals hey my wi-fi kicked me out and you guys carried on seamlessly thank you <laughs> Welcome back. Um, Graham was just making a very good point about the direct debits being the cheapest way of paying for things. So, because of that price premium, if you're not having, um, if you're uh, if you can't get a direct debit, if you're deemed that you're not credit worthy enough, then you basically have to pay more. And and Brendan was making a just joining in the excellent point of, and it's a point I wanted to make um, is that as a thinking about consumers, they don't care about open banking. It's where is the value? What is the value proposition you're offering? It's a payment rails. It's a it's a technology term that we get all excited about, but in reality, when I see that, I think you know crazy figures of how many um, how, what percentage of the UK population aren't aware of open banking, and and I think I don't care so long as it benefits them, so long as you can make that offer. That's what matters. Whether you know the um, technical terms for stuff doesn't matter. I would, yeah, I would agree. I think that's a really good point. I, a while ago now in OBIE, this was a big debate with the industry. My personal view is it's so use case specific. So if you're applying for a mortgage and what you're doing is you're clicking a button to give access to your data so you don't have to send paper statements, that's a very different scenario than if you're pressing a, a button to pay with confidence. So yeah, trying to explain the, the technicalities to the customer is... Is, is maybe not the right approach, is how do you make sure there are great customer experiences in value-adding use cases? Yeah. Which perhaps sort of brings us, I know we're, we're, we're sort of running last, last five minutes or so now. So we've sort of navigated from where are we today, what's happening around the world, getting into where is this going to go next? We've talked embedded finance, we've talked variable recurring payments. We, we mentioned open finance a little bit at the the beginning as well it, it would be great just to get your your perspectives on um again this is this is this is arguably the cop out last question in a um in in a in a panel but genuinely it'd be really interesting to get your perspectives on let's look five years out we've got through implementation challenges what what do you think the world the world of api powered access looks like what's it going to enable what yeah, how will it change the industry? Graham, perhaps we could start with you. Oh, okay. Uh, so I'll go with super apps because I think you want simplicity in your life. You just want a dashboard that you can look at and you can just feel in control, whether it's your calendar, whether it's the urgent mails, whether it's your money. I think having that 
calmness of something that's smart enough and intelligent enough, well-informed enough with the right data points, to Phil's point, that actually is genuinely useful. In five years' time, if we can have that, then I'll know when to retire and I'll feel much happier. So, <laughs> so re retirement is a dream, whatever happens within the industry. <laughs> well, to have your, um, your pensions in there would be like, because I mean, yeah. It just feels like having all of that together in a place would uh, would be very useful to help you make better decisions and just feel better, hopefully feel better about life. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Brendan, be interested in, in your thoughts. So I would take it one step further, Graham. Open banking to me was nothing but the start of the journey. Open finance is but an interim step within the journey. And we move to a true sort of open data type of um, environment, whereby my data is stored with providers. I have the ability to access that data, to use that, to share that data, which brings better outcomes for me. And, you know, there are so many different vertical markets out there where we're already seeing these structures come in. We talked about open banking, we talked about finance. In the UK, we've got Icebreaker one with the energy and so on. The you know, reality is when we talk about open banking outside of Europe, it isn't. It's open finance. It's much bigger than that. Open insurance, pension dashboards, and all that. I, I just think this is the start of a really revolutionary journey. I think with open banking, we felt our way. I think we understand a lot better now. And I think as an industry, we are in a stronger position to execute. Yeah, it's interesting. Again, you think of, of industries like health and then the amount of data that exists through wearables and, and the apps we use it. There's clearly a lot of opportunity for secure, connected um, industries, a lot of yeah. opportunity to help people's lives and well-being and financial health and all of those things yeah. and i don't know sorry just a little one there on health view i don't know if you've got the nhs app which i downloaded about a year ago. i can see when i was back going back to the doctor when i was in my late teens with the ailments that were being prescribed why can't that be shared with others if i needed it to be because i've got a similar condition say now yeah exactly right yeah no it's a it's a great point so it's phil last again but but certainly not least what are your thoughts I, I will strike a slight note, note of caution for five years out, but I'll hopefully lend, end on a, a more optimistic one. I think with things like open, with um, pensions dashboard, if that actually ends up happening, pensions, so much information is probably still stored on paper in a filing cabinet that no one's opened for 20 years and insurance as well. So there's going to be, there's going to be some delays as I it kicked off with, but I think an awful lot of the industry is going to digitize, have to digitize their processes and I'm not a fan of digitization of taking what exists on paper and turning an electronic version. And that's where the optimist in me comes out of going, if you're, if the, if you're a pension provider, if you're an insurance provider and you go, oh, right, great, I've got to digitize all this, let's do this for 18 months and then we'll create an API for it, you're going to lose out. You, someone will come and eat your lunch, whether it is a fintech, insurtech, something else in that space, or whether it's even one of the big banks going, we are actually going to do the right thing for the customer if all you're interested in is digitizing a huge stack of data and providing it via an api you're going to lose so in five years from now i think that we'll, we won't quite have open finance that i'd like to have but i think there will be a big push towards major companies doing the right thing for the customer and those ones that just don't get it they will be dwindling away and that will be a good state to be in I think that's a great point to finish on, actually. It's a couple of things within there that jumped out to me. One, it, ultimately, this is about the customer, whether that's a consumer or a business and and and, and helping them, um, but also that this is strategically important. This isn't just a compliance project. This is a, this is a genuine business model transformation, and you either get it right or you will suffer. Um, I think that's brought us right up to time. So gentlemen, thank you. This has been a, a really interesting conversation. Apologies that I left you for a short moment, but thank you for sticking around. Um, so it was my pleasure to, um, to to host this panel. And yes, I thank you all. And I think now the audience um, can all go off for their break, which I think was the uh, the next piece.